Hi, Dr. Angie. I am so excited to have you here and have this conversation that we're about to have. I'm very inspired by your journey. And um, so thank you for being here. It's my absolute pleasure, Alicia. I grew up watching your movies, and I think you're, you're just a brilliant, beautiful soul, beautiful inside and out. And it's such a pleasure to be talking to you today. And it's quite surreal, but here I am. I thank you for choosing me on this show. Oh, thank you. Um, can you please tell people who you, like, describe who you are to, to our listeners? Yes. So I am a plant-based gastroenterologist. Um, I am mom to a 14-year-old boy named Bijan. We live in Orange County, California. My practice is in Newport Beach, California. And I try to just, it's kind of a beautiful thing because as a physician, I've realized that I can help so many people with their health through this plant-based eating. So I have integrated my nutrition and uh, lifestyle um, into this practice of gastroenterology. And um, so it's kind of an exciting thing I've going on here. And I'm really happy to share my knowledge um, with the listeners today. And um, I want to know more about your background in terms of one, where you come from, where are your parents from, where were you born? I hear a little bit of an accent. Um, and I also want to know what made you interested in doing work, this gastro work? What, what, what made you interested in the first place? So I grew up in Iran until I was 13. Mm -hmm. So we immigrated here in um, 1987. And pretty much from, I think when I was nine years old, I knew I was going to be a physician. <laughs> and so I remember praying that I would come to America because I was like, you know, this is, <laughs> this is how I'm going to have the chance to actually achieve this goal. I had watched a Madame Curie or Marie Curie, the famous Polish uh, physicist documentary. And, you know, this is why it's so important to have um, for Hollywood to... Um, to show the work of these successful women because th it creates a compelling vision for younger women to know that, yes, they can be scientists, they can be physicians, they can achieve whatever goals they uh, have. And so after watching this documentary, I was sure that, you know, I'm going to be a physician. And um, so I kept praying that I come to the U.S., uh, we finally moved here during the Iran and Iraq war, which was uh, unfortunately a horrible time. But I was, I saw the war, I would see bombs dropping and people dying. And maybe that was another reason m my feelings of becoming a physician actually strengthened to, to help people. Mm. So when I moved to the U.S., I was so excited because really this this country is the, is the land of opportunity. And if you really want to do something, you can. And so I put my focus and att attention to school and educating myself. And um, thankfully, I was able to achieve my goals. It wasn't easy. It's been a very difficult journey for, you know, those of uh, people, those of you who are listening, it's very difficult to move across the world to another country and not speak the language and not know the customs and the traditions and suddenly insert yourself in the population and try to like perform a certain way in school. But I survived <laughs> and it made me a strong person. And I feel like it made me a more compassionate person. That takes a lot of courage to show up somewhere and just be completely alone in your ability to, you know, to communicate with other people. I mean, I imagine any, any of us in America could imagine moving to another country and suddenly not knowing the language and have to participate and go to school and learn. It's incredibly brave. I can't wait to get to the plant-based stuff, of course. I'm dying to talk to you about that. But I'm curious about the, what it was like doing your job prior to understanding plant-based nutrition. You know, what were you you know, the patients that came in, what were you dealing with? And then how did you treat them? And then crossing over to how it's so different now. Yes. Yeah, so I became a vegan seven years ago. And before that, I was 
a board certified gastroenterologist and internist, but I didn't really realize how much literature is out there in regards to the importance of gut health and um, in regards to disease prevention in an association with nutrition. I had no idea. I mean, people ask me like, did you go vegan because you studied medicine and you learned all this nutrition in school and, and figure out how important it is? I was, I, and they're always shocked to hear my answer. No, I'm an ethical vegan. And what happened is when I chose to uh, become a vegan, because of the animals, I looked into the literature and realized that the health benefits are there. It's just not emphasized upon. So I realized how hopefully powerful I can be in the clinic setting if I could prevent disease and focus on disease prevention. We all need to, at some point, seek Western medicine, and it does miraculous things. You know, if you have something wrong, you go to the hospital. If you have a cancer, we can cut it out. You can get chemo. If you have a GI bleeding, we can go in there and cauterize the bleed and clip it and stuff the bleeding. But the focus should be prevention, right? So we help our patients in the clinic setting before they get hospitalized, before they have the need of having all these procedures and surgeries done. So it all started clicking, and I realized how important lifestyle is in prevention, and in particular, nutrition. And if when I go to the hospital to round, I realize that nine out of 10 diseases I am dealing with could have been prevented with lifestyle. If patients would eat a plant-based diet, if patients stopped smoking and drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, it, just right there, and maybe working out three times a week, just right there, you could eliminate 99% of diseases I see in the hospital. So thankfully, because of the animals, uh, all of this came to me, and I started reading about nutrition, and I studied the data that's there, but it's not emphasized upon. So I, I just explored all of this, and I realized, wow, it's, it's there. Um, and in my field, colon cancer is the second biggest uh, cancer killer in both men and women in the U.S., and if you think about it, eating a plant-based diet could prevent polyp formation and cancer for formation. So I'm like why is this not emphasized upon a little bit more? And, but who cares at this point? Because I am in the position where I could spread the news. And thanks to people like you, because it's so, so much more impactful when someone like you speaks about it, because this message could be, could be taken from a clinic where I probably see about 10, 15 patients a day, and be announced to millions, potentially. And so thank you for doing this. This is very powerful. Thank you. I imagine, I, I'm so excited imagining you in your office with your 10 or 15 patients a day. And if they come in and say, this is what's happening, and, and then you start, you know, let's say seven years ago, you maybe wouldn't have talked to them about the prevention, right? You would just go straight to treatment. And so now I'm imagining you sitting there going, okay, we can, here's what we can do. Before we do this, this, and this, you have a chance to fix this. We can change your diet. You can start exercising. You can stop doing this and that. And if you're with me, we can stop you from having this surgery or this medication, right? And then the question is, how many of them, do they, how many of them listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, let me put something out in the universe. I hope that one day you just come in here in this clinic and see me, okay? Just, <laughs> just come say hi. If you're ever in Orange County, just walk in because that would just make my day, year, and maybe the rest of my life. But anyway, <laughs> sorry about digressing. Uh, but right now, I get a lot of people who come in with gastroesophageal reflux disease and problems. But I'm hoping that we get to a point so my clinic is called Institute of Plant-Based Medicine because I integrate nutrition into my practice. And I'm hoping that we will attract younger and younger patients into the clinic and focus on prevention before they're in their 40s and 50s and actually prevent disease. And so that's one of my goals, to close the gap, because, again, 
100% of the focus right now is on screening for certain diseases and treating certain diseases where it should be a little bit more about prevention. So that's my goal. But I would say that it's it takes repetition. I think that you have to talk about it. And I would say the majority of patients make changes. I don't think that it's always quick and it's not always a hundred percent, but I would rather change. For example, if I'm seeing a hundred patients, I would rather see 90 of them make changes than 10 of them go a hundred percent plant-based. Yes. It makes a bigger impact in regards to health. It makes a bigger environmental impact and it definitely reduces the uh, you know, animal cruelty that we all know exists. So any way you look at it, it's very important to talk about it. And you never know when, and you never know what you say that makes that person want to go more plant-based. Whereas when I first started, I was very gung-ho about like turning every single one of my patients vegan. I've realized it's just a little bit too unrealistic and people have to get there on their own terms. I am now a little bit softer with a softer approach and I try to just explain the science and just take, give them time and it will come. It's just, you just have to plant the seeds. So have you had the experience, I'm sure you have, of patients coming in and being so vulnerable with where they are in their health and really looking to you and then you get them on the plant-based diet or 80% there or 90%, whatever, and they see changes and then they're healed and you get to have that amazing experience? Yes. So 60, about 60, over 60% of the population is lactose intolerant. So one of the things I see is when people come in with severe diarrhea, uncomfortable bloating and gas and altered bowel habits um, and kind of like IBS symptoms, one of the most miraculous things that happens in a GI clinic is when they come in and you ask them to stop consuming dairy and they come back and they think you're a genius and that you're <laughs> such a good doctor. <laughs> it's sad that they had never heard it from anyone else, but they're like, I feel so much better. Thank you so much. I mean, that's literally what I do, at least like first visit people with gas, bloating, abdominal pain, diarrhea. I test for two things, lactose intolerance, which basically it's the easiest way to do it is abstinence. Go for one month without consuming any dairy products. And I say, read labels and avoid the dairy for a whole month. And they come back. Oh, and I check for celiac disease because that's one of the other reasons people get bloated. So they come back and, you know, um, they're like, wow, I stopped eating dairy and I'm feeling so much better. This is fantastic. So... <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's really cool uh, because you know as a plant-based gastroenterologist um, I can tell you uh, it's I've been able to do so much and it doesn't even require a gastroenterology certificate to do that any internal <laughs> medicine doctor could do that any family practitioner could do that but I'm trying to spread the word but but yeah I mean it's pretty cool a lot of people are vulnerable because they're suffering yeah they're having GI problems they're having discomfort and irritable bowel syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux. I have patients who have 30 bowel movements a day. Can you imagine how disruptive mm. it is to, mm. for example, be on a movie set and have to go to the bathroom every minute or be at work in corporate America in a meeting and have to run to the bathroom? And so people are vulnerable and um, they're willing to listen. And I realize, they don't realize that fiber can actually bulk the stool. People think fiber can, it causes diarrhea. So they go on TikTok or Instagram and they listen to these people who are like, eat meat and uh, it's good for gut health. I mean, of course, these people are non-evidence-based and, and quacks, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately they are out there. For, for every one good account like yours, there are actually a couple of bad ones spreading misinformation. So people do get fooled into eating more meat if they're having diarrhea because they, they think, they assume that fiber causes diarrhea, but it's actually not true. Fiber bulks the stool. It's the most natural product you could consume to, if you're actually having diarrhea, it bulks your stool. And if you're having constipation, it helps 
alleviate the hard stools. So it takes your stool. Here we are having a poop conversation, right? Lovely. <laughs> the best ones. <laughs> but um, it literally normalizes your stool. If it's hard, it becomes formed. If it's loose, it becomes formed. So anyhow, it's very important to improve your diet when you're having these types of problems by eating more plants and getting that fiber in your diet. And another really awesome thing I wanted to talk about is it's not just helping the GI tract, is it? I mean, no. you, you, if you asked some of my cardiology friends, they would tell you that actually there is so much research out there, more than gastrointestinal research. There is so much cardiovascular research out there in how Mediterranean diets, plant-based diets can prevent heart disease. So I feel like <laughs> secretly I could be a cardiologist because <laughs> I'm kidding, but I'm helping them with their GI tract, but they're also preventing cancers everywhere else, heart disease, which is the number one killer in the US. Uh, so anyway, it's just all around good. I think it's also really interesting and brave that you put plant-based on your door. You, I, I didn't realize that you were advertising it as, you know, I think you said, What's, what's the practice called? Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. Yeah, so I was thinking you were sort of getting somebody in there saying, oh, I have these problems, and then, but now they already know when they walk in what they're going to, so. Oh, yes. It's, it's all a, over my website. It's all over everything because, and so, and, and people are very curious. I mean, I, I, I have uh, about 50% of my patients were my patients before I changed the name. Okay. It yeah. used to be Angie Sidigam Dink, and now it's Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. So a lot of them knew, but uh, the new patients uh, come to me and they ask me, uh, what does this name mean? And, and explain to me. And then I'm like, I'm glad you asked because we need to talk about nutrition. <laughs> That's beautiful. Um, I wanted to just mention, you had said earlier something about this, and it's always boggled my mind and I think many people have no idea that most doctors have no nutrition experience at all that that they there's a two-week optional course in medical school for nutrition and I don't think people understand how insane that is and so I just wanted you to speak to that because you're one of the rare. I mean, luckily, they're, they're being born everywhere. There are more and more people are waking up to this. But I don't think most people understand that for reals, your doctor doesn't, you know more about your health, I mean, about food probably, than your doctor, and unless it's you. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because even that very limited nutrition the, uh, that they offer in medical school, I skipped every class because I was like, oh, my God, like, why do I have to know this? Like, I didn't. <laughs> I skipped every class. I was like, this is so silly. I'm going to be a doctor. I don't care about this. And I like literally was like, oh, I was like, teach me more pharmacology and uh, microbiology and anatomy and this garbage. Oh my God. And it's so weird. Don't ever say anything like that because it comes back at you and like, it, it, like it's a, like an avalanche. It's like, oh my God, the one class that I should have paid the most attention in. And it's like, by the way, you can cruise through your 40s and not have problems, but let me tell you, as a doctor, if you're not watching what you're doing, when you're 55, things are going to break down. I don't care who you are. <laughs> if you're not watching your diets, if you're not exercising, if you're drinking too heavily, if you're smoking, bad things are going to happen. And and then people tell you, well, my great grandfather lived to be 90 and he smoked. Yes, there are outliers. But, you know, I mean, don't live by that because it's like statistically speaking, you're going to be in trouble. And like you said, you know, you're, you hit your 50s and 60s. It starts with chest pain and like coronary disease. And then suddenly you're something called claudication. You're walking and you're not getting good circulation, erectile dysfunction, can't breathe. Um, then suddenly your legs swell up and things, bad things keep happening. And then you go to the cardiologist and you're taking the aspirin and the blood thinners, et cetera, et cetera. And then you start having a GI bleed, of course, right? <laughs> then we fix the GI bleed and we put you on some other medicine. Because of the medication they gave you, right? Yeah it, yeah, it happens all the time. And I'm not suggesting that you don't listen and not take yeah. the medications because you could die. But I'm just saying that it leads to other problems. And then, then you take other stuff. And then 
One day you wake up and you're on 15 medicines and the side effects of medicines can be bad too. If things get layered and more complicated and you develop more and more diseases and more and more side effects. So I am hoping that people who are watching and listening know that what they do on a daily basis as far as lifestyle can prevent some of the complications in, in the old age. Not old, I mean, 65 is not old. And, and a lot of people tell me, well, I would rather live my life than have to like eat healthy all, all the time. And, you know, I just want to live my life. Well, and I always tell them, listen, I just I wish that I could take you to the hospital with me one day and so you could round with me to see that these people are not living their life. They're living 10, 20 years of misery in and out of the hospital, getting dialysis, getting their hearts, uh, like, um, you know, stented um, on the surgery table all the time, getting scoped and this and that. And it's just not living. It's surviving. And it's no fun. If, if you, I, I think in my whole humble opinion, if you could eat badly every day and then one day drop dead and, you know, you quote unquote lived your life, that would be good. But it doesn't work out that way. You end up having 20 years of just awful, awful living. So anyway, if I could just like get you to think about that for a second and realize that when you start dealing with illness, like for example, you develop diabetes, you have to take medications and then, you know, then you get neuropathy, then you have to take more medications and then you develop eye problems, you have to take more medications. I mean, you'll wake up one day and you'll be, you'll be on 15 things. And, and all I'm saying is you could prevent so many of these diseases by just putting more plants on your table. That's it. It's simple. Yes, it's you know, really, really simple. Get it's hard exercise. for people to imagine, I think, but when you've experienced it, it's it's so simple and it's so miraculous. Um, you've also said, which you kind of already said again, but you said it beautifully, almost every single disease I diagnose and treat in the clinic has something to do with diet. You were given certain genetics. I love this. But genetics load the gun and nutrition pulls the trigger. There's not even... There's not even one single disease I can think of as far as the gastrointestinal tract that is concerned that doesn't have something to do with nutrition. I, I think that is so important. And I think I, um, Dr. Esselstyn had uh, been, uh, I think he's the one who first said that uh, genetics loads the gun and nutrition pulls the trigger. I really believe in that. It's um, and, and, and by the way, if, if you are listening and you have some kind of a disease, don't feel bad or guilty that you did something wrong. It, things can happen. Like there are a lot of genetic diseases that we have no control over, but I just want people to know that it's a very small percentage of disease that's directly related to genetics, um, environmental causes. And by saying environmental causes, just remember nutrition is a huge part of it are, um, the most common cause of chronic diseases like diabetes, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and uh, heart disease and gastrointestinal disorders. But I want, I, want to, I want to mention that even if I one day die of a certain disease, I still want to say that it's not about me. It's not about this one person. It's about if you review the science and if you review the data, a plant, eating a plant-based diet is essential in keeping a healthy body. And yes. so don't look at individuals or one example of some person in a rock band who died of a colon cancer. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't know if they like were also uh, snorting cocaine. I don't know. I mean, it's just, it's, it's well, like a whole lifestyle. I think it's really important what you're saying. I think that there are Many, I mean, if I think about the examples in my life of people who had leukemia, lupus, cancer, um, heart problems, someone who had, you know, was 200 pounds overweight, the people that I have encountered on my healing journey who have changed their lives, that those numbers far outweigh the one or two people that you hear who happen to maybe be sort of vegetarian who also died. They do exist, but the but but when you see the amount of healing that occurs through this lifestyle and and then you just have to look at the stats. I mean, in the Kind Diet, the book I wrote, I just pulled all the Harvard medical stats and there were the, the current at that time the current um 
uh, medical journals were you don't have to look far to see how much a plant-based diet benefits everything from a to z up so it's it's yes there if you're looking statistically if we're looking at data you're going to find the one or two that are not going to benefit but the massive amounts of numbers that are benefiting are so extraordinary that you can't ignore it and genetics i, I people love to tell me about genetics and say but no, but it's genetic and yeah think <laughs> I think I learned it from Dr. Neil Bernard, um, and I love Esselstyn and was thinking about him when I was thinking about you. Um, but, you know, because Esselstyn was a, is a cardiologist who got sick and tired of having people come into his office and need heart surgery. He, he was making a great penny, a pretty penny doing it, but he wasn't he wasn't satisfied that he wasn't able to fix them. And so he ended up instead when people would come in, he'd go and change, he'd go grocery shopping with them and change their diets and, you know, <laughs> I keep, love that. Te- teach them how to cook and l- completely transform their health. And, th- and then they didn't have to do it anymore. You know what I do? I go to this uh, hospital called um, Enlo Regional in Chico. And sometimes they're sitting there in their hospital bed, they're bored. So I like, take their iPad and I download something on there for them to watch. Oh, good. And it helps, you know, like I think one time I downloaded Forks Over Knives good. for a patient. Good. And then later on, he had relayed a message to me. To, to, uh, so he got discharged, went to see my nurse practitioner in the clinic and said, tell that, tell that Iranian doctor I did go plant based. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> they can't remember my last name, Sudegi. So they're like, tell that Iranian doctor, you know, I did go plant based and thank you. It's really cute. Are there any... I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any big myths that you know, I'm, I'm specifically thinking about paleo diet and the keto, is it the keto diet? Is there a keto, keto? diet? Keto, <laughs> keto diet that, you know, people love to say really helps. And I mean, it definitely helps with losing weight because you're restricting your calories, but in terms of being actually a healthy thing, do you have any brilliant information that you can share for people about why those are not healing and healthy? Yeah, I mean, there's this uh, there's this thing going on where people are actually, you know, Alicia when when uh, Alicia when the carnivore diet came out, I laughed. I was like, "Ha!" Oh, I never heard about that one. When did that? Oh happen? yeah, there is this crazy carnivore diet where these people eat like only meat, and you know, I was like, "Well, it's obvious that people will know that they become vitamin deficient and they, it's fiber deficient and they'll be ill." But sure enough, it's actually, it has taken off. So there are a lot of fad diets. And I think it it initially starts because um, you're right. It takes off because any diet you do that restricts calories, you can lose weight. So and everyone's trying to lose weight. So it's like um, they try it and, you know, they can drop a few pounds, but they don't realize that if they continue eating that way, it can be detrimental. So um, I see... I see it all the time, people going uh, keto, people going, um, you know, cutting out carbs, which it's fine if you're cutting out refined sugar, but it's really important to understand that fiber is pretty essential for your gut health. And you shouldn't cut out fiber rich foods like beans. Um, A lot of people think that they should cut out beans and fruits, which makes no sense. But making a blanket statement, cut out carbs, which happens all the time, right? Um, So fiber is pretty essential for the gut, right? So in the old days, I remember when the Atkins diet came out, I even (laughs) tried it when I was a teenager and I was so unhealthy, Alicia. I was, so I dropped a few pounds for my wedding, but um, I got dark circles under my eyes. I was feeling uh, like I started getting back pains and I think I had kidney problems from um, the protein load I was I was eating. I was eating like crazy stuff, like really fattening stuff. And, you know, I was probably consuming a ton of saturated fat, right? And mm-hmm. saturated fat increases your cholesterol and causes heart disease. I remember I was listening to somebody talk about nutrition and they were pro-keto and they said that carbs are completely unnecessary. I mean, can you imagine someone saying that in a nutrition class that, you know, you don't even need carbs to survive. As long as you eat protein and fats, you should be fine. There, there's a study that came out that showed that if you don't eat fiber 
and you don't eat enough fiber, um, then the gut gets eroded and you're actually basically um, killing the gut mucosa and you're exposing yourself to disease and your gut can become damaged. So at the time when this guy made this statement that you don't even need carbs, I'm sure this, this, these studies were not available. And then of course, after this animal study that I'm talking about, uh, populational studies came out about the gut microbiome and how people who eat a majority plant-based diet have a healthier gut microbiome. And now we know the importance of gut microbiome and there's so much to be learned about this still, but you know, how important it is to eat fiber and feed these little guys, the microbiome fiber, because that's what they thrive off of. So more and more studies are coming out. And so it's uh, pointing us to the direction of eating more plant-based. Um, but it's, it's a new field. I can understand that the, the keto diets have stayed popular because of, um, our old thinking that you don't need fiber, you don't need carbs. What were the, when you went vegan, what were the first things that you noticed in your own body? Well, the first thing that happened is I, I became very pissed off because I had to fight with my family. <laughs> <laughs> Anxiety and depression. I'm kidding. No, I'm just completely <laughs> joking. Um, I, I come from an Iranian family and, you know, meat eating is like, I mean, if there's no meat on your table or on your plate, you're just not even eating a meal. You know, when you go vegan and it's like a light bulb goes off in your brain and you're like, oh my God, I feel so enlightened. And I, I just like, it was so weird. Like I just, um, I was like so excited overnight. I was so excited about it and I did it. And then it kept getting more exciting. I was extremely exhausted. I had depression, anxiety. I had, um, I was overweight. I was tired. And so I, I went vegan and I was really excited about it. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, like I'm, I'm going to do this. And I did it. And every day I gained more energy. It was like, so weird. Like I would say six months into it, no one could compare. I, I can tell you I had the most energy in the world. Like no one could come close to me. I was like out, I was like doing 75 decline pushups at the gym. I would like, I would beat guys in doing pushups. Like my trainers, like I've never seen a chick do that. <laughs> it was so funny. I was like doing pull-ups. I was doing jump pushups, you know, where you jump off the ground, clap and go back down. Oh my God. Like insane stuff was happening. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Where is this energy coming from? Like, it's like, of, of course my cells were clean. I feel like my blood was clean. I feel like I was detoxing, which is not a very medical word, but I was like, like just feeling amazing. And I had this probably was getting all these micronutrients that were missing in my diets. Right. And probably my, uh, uh, basically, uh, body was getting rid of all this, this disgusting saturated fat and cholesterol. And, uh, my gut microbiome was improving, but all I can tell you is I, I got like, I achieved the body of my dreams. You know, I lost all this unwanted weight and uh, I think I lost close to 30 pounds and um, looked 20 years younger. I swear I looked 20 years younger. I would like people at the gym thought I was either a trainer or a fitness model. And I'm like, no, I'm just a doctor. Like I was, I was working <laughs> no, out with I'm my friend. I was working out with a friend and, and the trainer came and says at Equinox, she, he's like, ma'am, it's illegal to train professional trainers to use our gym to train. I'm like, oh, no, 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 I'm not a trainer. I swear I'm a doctor. He's like, oh, <laughs> but it was so cool. Alicia, it was like, I just, I, I, I like seriously recommend this to people who are listening right now. Just try it. Trust me, like try it for like six months. And if you don't have a ton of energy, I mean, you know, yeah, I just yes. trust me. You will. <laughs> yeah. I have the same experience and thank you for sharing your story because it's so beautiful. Did you, but how do we speak to the detoxing? Because I know that, um, I all, I often tell people when you first start something like this, you are going to, you know, there's going to be times where your body is going to be tired and you're going to be, you know, feel sludgy. And it's because your body's trying to release all of that icky stuff that was inside of you. And it takes a minute and then it pops back up and, you know, you kind of have to, 
I think some people give up because they go, oh, I'm feeling tired. So it means that I can go back to eating what I was eating that also made me feel tired. But they're not really recognizing that the body has to discharge all of this stuff. You have to get rid of, you've got toxic sludge flying around in there. You got to get it out and it takes time. You know, and, and one of the most important things is a lot of people, when they go vegan, they don't eat enough. And that's mm-hmm. where they, they uh, you know, I, I had a, um, a psychiatrist yesterday who was my patient tell me that he started eating meat again after he talked to me because he said, I lost so much weight. I'm like, well, you're just, you weren't consuming enough calories, you know. Anyway, when I first went macrobiotic, I had about five days of feeling grouchy and I was already vegan, but I had like grouchy, irritable. And I called the macro counselor and said, is this normal? She said, absolutely normal. And, um, and then it went away and I was just like a superhero. That's why in my book, I call it superhero diet. I'm so glad you stuck with it. Oh yeah, no. I just was, I knew that I needed to do it. I, I knew it was for, for my own soul. I wasn't going to be able to contribute to the animal suffering anymore. For me, that was just not happening. But then- Oh no, the, I mean, when you started eating healthy, even though yes. you were tired, oh, yes. you stuck with it. And thank yes. God for your coach, you know? And so like, we all need people that we can, we should be able to call and ask, you know? Yes. Um, Cause I mean, you know, you were eating all this soy ice cream and you're getting a sugar high and getting <laughs> exactly. this fake energy. And then suddenly you're eating kale and um, quinoa. Yes. And do you see what I mean? But if yes. you stick with it, like you said, you detox your way out of, you know, then you, you just suddenly all these good foods, like, you know how your taste buds change too? Oh, Did that yes. happen to you? Yes. It, it's like so weird that when I eat these, uh, if I eat an unhealthy vegan ice cream, full of sugar, I just feel sick because it's just too sweet to my tongue now. Whereas I used to eat, um, you know, ice cream all the time and put even fudge on it and more sugary stuff. And now I'm like, oh my God, I can't, like I eat waffles without syrup, you know, because I can't take that sugar. It's just your body hel- uh, your, becomes healthier and healthier and your taste buds change and your energy comes from real foods rather than a sugar high. I'm a foodie. So I will confess and admit that I still really enjoy all of the um, extreme tastes, but my body doesn't like it. So while my brain and my tongue get excited to go have, um, like I had Indian food the other night with my friend and my son, and it was really the best Indian food in LA. I mean, it's incredible. But I had a food, you know, I'm having my little food moment. And then when it's done, I don't feel good. So I have to know, you know, like restaurant food, things like that. They're delicious. And I believe there's a place for them. But, but I know that, uh, my food that I eat at home, the clean, simple things fuel me and make me feel my best. So I'm always able to adjust accordingly, knowing I need to be on point tomorrow. I want to sleep well tonight. How am I going to do that? Right. I'm not going to have the things that are going to interfere with my body. I'm going to eat super clean today, and that's going to help me sleep well. And then I'm going to wake up refreshed, and my body's going to be happy and not mad. Exactly. And it's so funny how with plant-based eating, you have all this energy during the day, but when you go to sleep, you fall asleep, no problem. Yes. But, and oh you sleep God. well. It's kind of cool, right? It's amazing. For the I used to be a little bit of a sleep. What, is it, what do they call when they sleep, when you have problems sleep? Um, insomnia? Yeah, insomnia. I used to have that a little bit when I was younger. And the second I went vegan, that completely changed your sleep. What was sleep- the turning point for you? Like what made you like decide? Was it overnight or was it a progression? It was... Um, it was overnight because I, well, the, I talk about this in the kind diet because there's a, from eight to 12, sorry, from, from age eight to 21 was my flirting phase where I decided I was going to be vegan, but there was no one around, vegetarian, but no one went around me was vegetarian and I had no idea what I was doing. So it was sort of this wanting to believing I would, but not committing all the way, but having the moral compass of wanting that. But, um, and then when I was 21, I had seen this documentary and, and I was also really connected to this dog that I had rescued and I would rub his legs and kiss his mouth and he'd sleep in bed with me. And I just realized he's basically my boyfriend. So why is it okay for me to be in love with my dog, but not respect and love these pigs and chickens and cows who all have the same desire to live. They don't want to be punched in the face. They like it when you pet them. They rub, when you rub a pig's leg, they're like, Ooh, and same with, same with cows and same with turkeys. They, a turkey was sitting in my lap the other day, just purring in my lap and they let you kiss them. And so I just, I think that I was, I realized I was being 
you know, uh, unfair. I was not considering that these other creatures needed love and, and kindness and wanted to live and didn't want to be harmed. And so that's really what happened for me. And when I made that connection, I did it overnight because I couldn't look at myself in the mirror anymore and say, I'm an animal lover and I'm a good person while I'm contributing to the suffering that I was with. Cause I'd seen this documentary. It was so awful. And once you understand where your food is coming from, then I think it's, it's really hard to turn away from, I think. And, um, but some people still see it and do turn away from it. So then I wonder about them. <laughs> like, what's yeah, that about? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I know. It's, it's, it's sad. But, mm-hmm. you know, um, one of the things people don't realize is that these sentient beings are being tortured in, um, in their environments where, where they're farmed. And um, like my mom used to think that they're actually treated very nicely in the slaughterhouses and in, in like they're killed humanely and they're treated humanely. Yes. And I, I actually had to like explain to her what really happens. So for some reason, like you when you think when I was younger growing up, I was like, well, obviously, nobody would mistreat these animals that end up on my plate. And they're like, I'm sure they're being treated with respect and kindness. No, they're not. And it's like, <laughs> so when I realized that, it was kind of an eye-opening thing, you know? Because yeah. you would never think that an industry in this day and age, in yes. the United States of America, would mistreat animals. And you think that, I'm sure they have laws against mistreatment. You, you assume these things, Of course, right? of course. And then you see the footage and you're like, oh my God, I can't, I can't even believe it. You know? And they have no rights in the courts they, because animals cannot be plaint- plaintiffs in the courts. So, yeah. um, and, and especially if you're a cow or a pig, um, at least pets have some, from what I understand, I'm not an attorney, some... Um, you know, rights. But if you are a cow or a pig or um, not a pet, you just have zero rights. And it's pretty sad, you know. I mean, I think we're going to look back at this in 50 years and be like, really? This really happened? You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it's kind of surreal. Yeah. I think it was Paul McCartney who said, (laughs) I don't know if he's the first one who said, if all slaughterhouses had glass windows everyone would be a vegetarian. I think most, a lot of people, just like you said, they're imagining it one way because they're, the carton that they bought the eggs in said it was that way. There's pretty cute pictures of chickens running around. The, the meat that you purchase, there's a happy cow, the milk. It's, but it's just, it's, it's all promotion and, um, and money and propaganda, and it's very sad. And also, I wanted to talk a little bit about the um the mind body how the gut is related to the mind because you know you talked about how much energy you got when you changed and became vegan and that happened for me too and i feel the difference day to day meal to meal if i have a really healing meal i'm like whoosh feel so good i'm energized and i do believe that the food that you eat when you sit down to eat your plate of food it can mess with your mood or it can make you feel really grounded clear-minded, happy. Your food can make you happy. Chewing your brown rice can make you happy. And I don't think people understand the connection between what you eat and how it truly affects your, because your gut affects your brain. So can you speak about that a little bit? Yes, I will talk about the gut brain connection. But before that, importantly, you know, I want to tell you how important it is to like, you know, when you go vegan, you almost become a little bit of a nutritionist too, right? Because we learn so much. And we start thinking about micronutrients and macronutrients and healthy and unhealthy. And and when I eat my food, I focus on, I, I'm like focusing on eating, but at the same time, I'm like feeling energized just by looking at these colors. And I'm like, wow, I'm getting all this vitamin B right now. And I'm getting all these antioxidants right now. I almost see these antioxidants cleaning my body and killing cancer cells, you know? So you really have to have, you know, this relationship that you have with food is important. Like you, you talked about making the carrots in a certain way, the way you make the carrot make you feel, makes you feel different. And it's so important. And, and I, I, f- I feel like in this Western society where, where we learn to go through the drive through and get garbage food and put it in our mouth because we have to get back to work as soon as possible. And 
like I can tell you every time I'm rounding at the hospital, I have someone who comes in with a food bolus infection and 99.9% of the time it's meat that gets stuck in the esophagus that won't go down and it's stuck in that pipe. And like, it's usually their hot dogs, red meat, pork, or, um, you know, uh, seafood, whatever it is, usually meat. And if people are eating so fast and they're not enjoying the food, they're not noticing anything. It's just, just eating it really quickly and it gets stuck. And so mm-hmm. I have to put them under anesthesia, put a scope and take it out to disimpact. It's pretty sad. So I wish that more people would, um, would um, have a better relationship with food and, and feel the nutrients in the food and, and have a beautiful, uh, you know, relaxing time when they're eating and enjoy the energy that they're getting from this food. In regards to the brain gut connection, it turns out that uh, the brain and the spinal cord have the most nerves, the most nervous system lives in the brain and the spinal cord, and the gut is the second most innervated organ. So there are a lot of nerves and neurotransmitters that connect the brain, which sends a signal through these nerves and wires through the spinal cord into the gut. And there's connection going back. It's like, imagine, um, train tracks that come from the brain into the gut and trains that go back to the gut, right? So it's all through molecules and neurotransmitters and neurotransmitters are the signaling little molecules that uh, take the signal from the gut into these nerves that take the signal back into the nerve nervous system, into your spinal cord and the brain. So there's a huge connection, right? And so it's no wonder that a lot of patients with irritable bowel syndrome um, have a history of depression and anxiety. I think about 60% of patients um, with IBS have some kind of depression and anxiety. And then you would be like, well, is it the chicken or the egg? Which one came first? No one knows. Could it be that the anxiety made their gut worse? Or was it the anxiety first that um, caused their um, depression? It's a good question and no one knows, but there's definitely a connection. But um, it's very important to know that these very important feel-good neurotransmitters, the majority of them are actually uh, made in the gut. So, for example, 90% of the serotonin, which is a very um, important neurotransmitter, is made by the gut cells. So the environment of the actual gut where signals are being sent back to the brain is very important. If you're keeping a healthy environment in your gut and promoting the production of good, good feeling, feel good, um, molecules, um, then it's going to end up generally, um, giving you a good feeling. But the most important thing is that the signals go back and forth from the gut to the brain and if you are nurturing your gut, eating the right foods that heals the gut, that helps the production of these feel-good neurotransmitters, you could very well um, improve your mental health. And so I always, I always teach my patients this brain-gut connection and the importance of eating healthy. And we need more studies to, to study this. Um, and it's not very easy to study, believe it or not. But I can tell you lifestyle makes a huge difference just by if you're drinking too much, if you stop drinking, which kills off the gut microbiome, if you stop smoking and if you eat plant-based, um, it's a tremendous, I mean, it's just that tremendously changes your mood. And I have to say, I think it's all because of the connections that we have in our gut with our brain through these neurotransmitters that take the signal, um, into the brain and back. Thank you, Dr. Angie, for explaining that serotonin is made in the gut. I'm sure that that explains a lot for a lot of people. I'm so happy speaking with you. I'm so excited about everything you said and um, ever so grateful for what you're doing in the world and thank you. the love that you're spreading and the healing that you're spreading. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you. And and by the way, if you're ever in Orange County, please surprise me. <laughs> I, I'm going to try. I'm going to need your I email mean, address. I don't so know I what I would do. Like if you just walked in here, I think I'll scream. But um, <laughs> absolutely, I will. I will email you okay. my email address. Okay, good. 